Hi everyone, my name is Jessica Dillon. Uh, this is actually my first time in Portland, so that's pretty cool. I should probably move that. Um, uh, just so you guys know, in the other room is my old coworker, Alex McPherson. Uh, he's gonna be speaking and he's pretty awesome. Um, his talk is widening your JavaScript application, organizational tips from the front end, front line. Uh, so I'm giving you the option to leave while you can, unless you wanna see me throw up because I'm pretty nervous. Um, my talk is going to be on a little bit more on the elementary side, just kind of introducing these uh, ideas to you. So if you're looking for a more of an advanced, higher level talk, I'd recommend going over there. Okay. So this is who I am on the internet. Um, if you like programming jokes and uh, photos of dogs, we can talk on there. And since none of you know who I am, because I've never done this before, uh, let me tell you a little bit about myself before we get into it. Uh, I really like Twitter. Um, I say this because if you have questions or comments during my talk or anything, feel free to tweet at me and I'll get back to you. Um, also, I tweeted this recently, so you guys should be a little bit concerned about the rest of the talk. Um, not my problem, you guys didn't leave, so. Uh, another quick thing I do want to point out is I would not Google Jessicard. I know as uh, a lot of the times when somebody's speaking, you'll Google them. Um, it's not me and it's not safe for work. So that's all I'll say on that and I'm sorry it's not on me anymore. Um, I'm also known on the internet for some reason as Garth, not by choice, uh, even though I've literally never seen Wayne's World. Uh, so that's something I don't quite like, so if you call me Garth, I probably won't talk to you. Uh, I personally don't see the resemblance, but anyway, I cut my hair off and dyed it purple, so now nobody can say anything. So I used to live in Boulder, Colorado, uh, up until recently, uh, last week to be exact, and I was working at this awesome consultancy called Quick Left. Um, if you read my bio, it said that, um, so it's kind of lying. Uh, they're really great and awesome, and I miss them terribly already. Um, however, if you want to see them speak, uh, Alex is speaking next door, and then Sam is actually speaking at 4.20 um, in track B, so go say hi and watch that. It's going to be about fixing broken windows, um, 10 small things that will instantly improve your project. Okay. So this all happened, this whole change happened when I was at a conference. It was at Heroku's Waza conference, to be exact. Um, I realized that there was gallons of Jessica programmers, it turns out, and I became friends with a bunch of them. Um, and this Jessica, Jessica Suttles, stole me away to be her coworker. So she's the big jerk. Um, so I recently made this trip in a U-Haul with my dog and my dad. Um, that's my dog. And started at G5, which is based out of Bend, Oregon. Yeah, G5. Um, so they've been around since 2005, and uh, they work with multifamily, senior living, and self-storage properties to use their uh, digital experience management software. Um, and the, go the company's growing super quickly. This is my small but awesome remote team. Uh, I work there as a software engineer, and right now I'm doing a lot of Ember and Rails work. Uh, this team is cool because they're known for taking one large monolithic Rails app, uh, built in 2007 and re-architecting it into a handful of smaller apps um, when we're using pulling, no pushing, and uh, using HTML micro formats as the API output, uh, no JSON. So if you're curious about our architecture, Shane Becker has a RailsConf talk called the Constellation Architecture, all the little apps. And so this is now my commute. Uh, I go from San Francisco to LA and then from LA to Portland, or Bend, not Portland. Um, Awesome, so let's go into real stuff, because that was kind of boring. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about when to stop using animate, oops, and start using CSS3 animations. Um, in this talk, I hope you walk out with an understanding of implementation differences of jQuery's animate function versus CSS3 animations and basic uses of them, uh, ease of use of each, and how to extend them for your own personal use. Um, all the examples we'll use are pretty basic, just to show you the kind of the idea of what's going on. We'll go over browser support and how to account for that. And we'll talk about browser performance, including some examples in uh, various developer tools. So Animate is, uh, it was added in jQuery 1.0, so back in 2006, so it's been around for a second. Uh, it lets you perform a custom animation on a set of CSS properties. So what you do is you pass in an object of CSS properties and the values that the animation will move towards. Um, and then you pass in a map of options. So let's look at an example. As a quick aside, I was dating this guy, 
And I loved him a lot, but he didn't love me back. Uh, so we started dating somebody named Selena. And I'm kind of upset. So we're going to use him as an example in all of this. So here's some markup for Biebs. Um, we've got a button to make him go by, and we've got an image of him. Pretty simple. So on click, what we'll do is we'll trigger an animation that toggles the height of Bieber over the course of two seconds uh, since he doesn't love me anymore and we want him to go away. So let's see if this works. I haven't, does that work? Yeah. So that's pretty boring, right? But it works. Ooh, got excited. Um, so that's pretty, pretty boring. But as you can tell, it works. Because it's jQuery 1.0, it is supported in uh, all current browsers in the previous versions and in IE6+. Plus. Well, up until 2.0, but we're talking about 1.x. So. Uh, so let's move on to CSS3. The first working draft of CSS3 was released in February of 2008, so quite a bit after jQuery 1.0's release. Um, but when I'm talking about CSS animations, I'm referencing two separate things. I'm talking about transitions and I'm talking about animations. Um, so let's talk about the differences there pretty quickly. So transitions are triggered by a reaction to a CSS property that has changed. Uh, for example, we, uh, we've got hover, we've got active, we've got focus. Um, I'm sure many of us have seen those. You can also use JavaScript to programmatically add and remove classes, that, and that will also trigger a transition. So let's look at an example. So we'll go back to Bieber. Um, since I don't really want to see his face anymore, we'll just add an image to cover it. And so what we'll do is we'll add this transition in here. And in this, we are using the transition shorthand. Um, the first is the property you're animating. Uh, there's a finite set of properties you can animate. We're going to do all for now. However, uh, this has performance implications and it's not widely recommended. The problem is with using all unnecessarily is that you're adding a lot of listeners uh, when you might not need them. And so your code will take a performance hit. But we're just using it for an example. Second is the amount of time in seconds we want the transition to take. And the third is the transi transition timing function. Um, this gets into easings. So uh, if you have questions about easings, I'd recommend going to easings.net. They've got really good examples of uh, different types of easings. So we have to add some styles here. Um, the important thing to note with these styles is that without the hover effect, the transition does nothing. Uh, so that big block of code right there will do nothing without that, um, that hover. When the hover is triggered, though, then it takes those transition details into account. So let's see what that does. Yay, that looks better. Yeah, we didn't like that anyway. OK, so let's move on to animations now. So animations don't need explicit triggering. Uh, they're self-invoking, and they run automatically on the page. And they loop themselves easily, which is uh, nice. So since Selena wants to be in the, photo, uh, in the picture so bad, let's just add her in. So with a transition, you have an initial and final state. But with animations, you have control over all the individual keyframes, uh, which is super powerful. Here we have an animation named Love, and we're controlling two different keyframes. Uh, we've got 0% where she has the CSS property of right 0, and where she 100% uh, where she is right 75%. Uh, you can add as many keyframes as you like. We're just keeping it simple here. So let's give her some style. The important thing is that we're specifying our animation. We want played on our element and the time it takes to play through the entire animation. This animation will start immediately once you hit that page and will not loop. Uh, however, these are things that you can add to animations if you'd like. For this example, it's fine. So this code produces this pretty unexciting effect. Um, but as you can tell, it runs automatically um, and then it did not repeat. So with animation, browser support, there's less support for older browsers than jQuery, uh, particularly in IE, which only has support above 10. For other browsers, we need the prefixes, which begs, why do we even go there? Uh, why would we even consider CSS3 at this point? Uh, using jQuery resulted in less lines of code, no browser prefixes, and more browser support. Well, there are some other things to consider here. 
So first off, albeit not too large of a concern uh, since it's its own barrel of monkeys, um, but if JavaScript is disabled, your animations will still work if they're done in CSS. You might have other issues with your JavaScript disabled, but at least your animations will work. Pulling out design effects into CSS helps uh, separate the design elements from the behavior components of your JavaScript, so, your, uh, so the separation of concerns is being helped there. This increases the maintainability of your code as well. And then last but not least, CSS3 is faster. Uh, it's worth looking into the performance hit being taken by jQuery. So a developer named Siddharth Rao did a performance test of jQuery animations versus CSS3 animations on dev.opera. And so we're gonna look and see what happens there. So we'll start with CSS3. What he did is he set up 300 divs to animate with CSS3 and then he animated them the exact same way with jQuery. This was the final result. Uh, he animated both height and opacity, so we're not doing anything crazy here. This is just to show the very small um, performance implications. So here's our divs, nothing exciting. We've just got 300 divs, um, not tricking you here. And we are making these divs be slightly, small, slightly opaque red rectangles at first. Uh, then we're adding on an animation named My Animation to be ran over the course of two seconds. And what this animation does is it starts out fully opaque with a height of zero, and then we grow to our original div opacity of 0.5 and a height of 25 pixels to make it a box. So Siddharth calculated the timing in Opera, so we're gonna look at that. Um, the entire thing is a little bit long, so it gets cut off of the slide. But the entire CSS3 animation completed in about 2.9 seconds with about 100 actions required. Siddharth then calculated the memory usage in Chrome's dev tools. Um, also, it's getting cut off because it's a little bit long, but TLDR, the memory used during the animation was about 1.5 megabytes. So, as a CSS3 recap, uh, the memory consumed was 1.5, the actions required were 100, and the time taken to execute was 2.9 seconds. So now we're gonna uh, replicate this in jQuery. So we're gonna get a little repetitive here. So we've got the same setup, 300 divs to animate with jQuery. Uh, the only difference is there is a button because we're not gonna be triggering the, uh, the animation is not gonna be automatically triggered. So we got the same results, nothing too exciting. Um, the animation completed. <laughs> Here's the markup, shocker. Um, it's a little bit repetitive, but we added that button to start that jQuery animation. Nothing's different about the animation, or the CSS, except for we did remove that animation in the style because we didn't need it. And then we added a little bit of JavaScript. Uh, so we had just have a handler that animates the div on click the same way we had with CSS. So, in Opera, um, this actually took about five seconds which is quite a bit different than 2.9 seconds to finish the entire animation. So there's a few things happening here. Um, the actual animation doesn't take that much longer because you'd notice a two second difference when you're only trying to animate uh, for two seconds. Uh, there's the actual overhead is when the J JavaScript is being loaded and um, there's a delay between the button being clicked and the animation starting. The amount of actions required were over 2,000. So there's quite a difference there. If we go into the memory, it comes up close to six megabytes, which is crazy. So, as a result recap, we've got six, 2,119 actions required, the time taken to execute was five seconds, but if we put them next to each other, we see a pretty big difference, and this is for a small animation. Um, so, if you're building larger animations, you're gonna notice even more of a performance implication there. So, CSS3 seems to be a clear winner in performance here. So let's talk a little bit about why that happens. Why is CSS3 faster? There's a lot of reasons for that, um, but I'm gonna go into some of the um, ones that would first come to mind, like the fact that CSS3 is native. So it's native to the browser written in C++. Um, unlike CSS, JavaScript is an interpreted language, as we know, um, so the JavaScript engine has to par parse and as execute at runtime. Um, CSS is also partially hardware accelerated. This is an interesting one because the GPU acceleration is tricky. There's no CSS specification for it. It's all um, based 
per browser. So if you're curious about the specs on that, you're gonna have to go to each individual browser and uh, see what they take care of. These uh, aspects of the document right here, the layout compositing, CSS3 transitions, CSS3 3D transforms, canvas drawing, WebGL 3D drawing, these are the aspects of the document that can be accelerated by the GPU. So these are your available options. However, they're not always taken advantage of. Um, latest versions of popular browsers like Chrome, Firefox, IE, Safari, Opera, all those, um, they enable some sort of hardware acceleration, however. Um, so it's best to take advantage of that when you can. Another thing to take into account is size. jQuery is not a small library. Uh, with the release of 2.0, it is smaller now, um, but it's still much larger than using something that's native to the browser. So using CSS potentially removes the need to add a large external library and additional requests. Um, so that's something to consider. So obviously, CSS3 clearly wins because it's faster, right? Uh, not quite. <laughs> There's a few thing, other things to consider here. So remember when we were looking at our code and we had all these pretty things? These are all of our browser prefixes. So how can we clean up this mess? Chris Coyer had some great recommendations in his CSS tricks post, how to deal with vendor prefixes. So we'll go over some of those because they're, they're great recommendations. So generally, um, you're gonna be hand authoring these. Um, so what you can do is you can use something like CSS3, please, and this will show you, an ex show you examples of CSS3 properties and their proper prefixes. Um, what's nice about this is you can edit the values in line and see how they change in the box on the right. Uh, you can toggle their properties on and off if you don't wanna see certain things on that box. Um, and there's a lot of super cool stuff to play around if you haven't really played with CSS3, so you can just go on there and kinda see how it affects things. Another thing you could use is something called prefix free. So this is hand authoring with the help of a library. There's a few things to consider with this though. It does make your CSS file smaller uh, and it is progressive enhancement since it will stop prefixing when browsers don't need it. However, it is now relying on JavaScript for CSS which is mixing the responsibilities of it for each and you're, you risk flashing elements on CSS3. So because it comes with some implications, I'd recommend using it with caution if you do use it. You can also hand author with something called prefixer. This will allow you to write no vendor prefixes or partial if for some reason there's another author that comes in and adds some and goes all willy nilly. Um, you will run your style sheet through this and uh, it will parse it and add on the appropriate prefixes. So what's cool is it won't duplicate any if there are partials in there, it'll only add the ones that you need. So another option is to use CSS preprocessors, which are all the rage right now. Our options here would be SAS or less, uh, which I'm not gonna go into the differences of each of those because I don't really wanna start an argument, but there are options for whatever you choose. Um, we'll, we'll go with some examples in SAS for this talk. So Compass, uh, it, it's a CSS framework using SAS. Uh, Compass has a lot of fun stuff in it, but for our purposes, it includes mixins for browser prefixes, which is what we want. So what you would do is you would import uh, the CSS3 module, and it provides cross-browser CSS3 mixins that take advantage of available pre-spec vendor prefixes. So that gives us something a little bit cleaner um, like this instead of all those large prefixes, because that becomes a little unwieldy. If Compass isn't quite your flavor, you can also use something like Bourbon, which has a robust set of CSS3 mixins as well. So we also have the issue of browser support. What if we need older browsers uh, support that CSS doesn't offer? We can use something like Modernizer to detect which features are available in that browser, and if it's not available, we can use jQuery to fill it in. So Modernizer gives you HTML classes for what's available and not available in that browser as a feature. Modernizer also gives you a set of Boolean variables telling you whether something is available or not so you can look for it in your JavaScript and behave appropriately. So let's look and see at the other options for polyfilling besides Modernizer. 
If we search for some of the CSS3 animation polyfills, this is one that keeps popping up. The only problem with this is if you go to the GitHub page, it was last updated a year ago. Um, so that's a little suspicious and I don't think we should use that. So we're gonna move on for now. Another one that pops up is jQuery Animate Enhanced. Uh, this one was up, last updated a month ago, so we're looking better. What this does is this extends jQuery's Animate to detect CSS transitions for WebKit, Mozilla, and Opera, and it converts the animations automatically. It's compatible with IE6+, which is what we're trying to do here. The plugin will analyze the properties you're animating on and select the most appropriate method for the, uh, for the browser in use. Um, the support is limited though, so you do wanna check which properties, because any properties not mentioned are taken care of by jQuery's Animate. The only issue with this is this kind of goofs with our idea of separation of concerns, right? Because we're bringing back in our design-oriented things uh, to our JavaScript. One option is to use something like Yep, Nope uh, to keep those JavaScript separate. Yep, Nope is a conditional loader integrated with Modernizer. Uh, this lets you load only the scripts that are needed. Here's an example of what yet, Yep, Nope gives us. Um, from these, we'll only use test, yep, and nope as an example, but they're all pretty useful. So what we could do is test for something like a CSS animation with Modernizer. If it's there, we load one file. If not, we can load the JavaScript polyfill file. So we can keep um, those separated like that. So let's step back to our early basic Bieber jQuery animation, because this brings up another point. Uh, so remember the animation complete callback right there? Uh, what about with CSS? We don't really have that available to us, do we? Well, we actually do. There are event listeners available for CSS transitions with the following prefixes. So we're back into our prefix mess. Um, as you can see, we've got WebKit transition end, O transition end, which actually recently made it all lowercase, so if you're using the uppercase, it might not work. Uh, MS transition end, and then just regular transition end. So these are for transitions, but we also have the same thing for animations. So yes, it is possible, it's a little clunky, um, but here's an example that we can use. So this is obviously not ideal uh, to set up listeners this way. There's way better ways of handling all the prefixing than this. But the point is, is that it's possible to attach the end, uh, to the end of a CSS animation. You can also listen for CSS3 starts and iterations in the same way. So if, you, if you're curious about more information on these, I highly recommend going to Mozilla and looking at their CSS animations guide. Uh, it, it's, it's pretty good for all this stuff. Okay. So now we know the implementation details of how to write a jQuery animation versus a CSS3 transition or animation. We know how to differentiate between CSS3 transitions and animations and when to use each. We know jQuery wins the browser wars, but we also know CSS3 wins the performance wars. So unfortunately, this is not an easy problem of when to use each. Um, there is no right answer, unfortunately. Uh, each has its drawbacks. It's obviously going to depend on what you're creating, what the requirements are, and the point is not to just def default to using jQuery's Animate, which I see a lot of developers do because it's comfortable and easy, and it's got that browser support. So what I recommend is, um, if the app allows it, I use CSS3, and if I need to support older browsers with um, those animations, then I, I use Modernizer. Uh, for any of those animations that need fallbacks. And then I also recommend using that preprocessor so you don't have to deal with all the vendor drama. This might not be the best solution in every case, but now at least we know what, what to consider when you are adding in these animations. There's quite a few resources online to find some cool already built CSS animations. One I recommend checking out is animate.css. Uh, simple stuff, it, it takes a button and it changes it in a bunch of different ways, but uh, it's pretty useful if you're looking for uh, little effects to add to your site. Another is CSS3 Playground. This has some awesome examples to play around with. Um, it goes over the browsers, the animations are known to work with, which is good, and what's been used to create them. And on that note, I talked really fast and I think I'm out of stuff to talk about, so thank you. Um, let's see, yep, that's it, thanks.
Okay, and then I can take questions now. Oh, I don't think that there's a mic here, though. Hi, uh, thank you for your speech. So I'm wondering, is this uh, slideshow available online somewhere? Uh, I'll be putting it up online after this talk. Okay, and where would we be able to find that? That's a great question. Um, what I'll do is I can uh, put it up online and then I will tweet the link to it. We're also going to put, once as people put their slides online, we're going to put them in the website yep. so they're, they'll be there for clicking on <laughs> and even looking at. Um, how do you feel about um, forcing browsers to uh, use GPU acceleration through uh, like transition Z0 or WebKit specific properties and such like, um, like on uh, iOS specifically? Um, I don't have any hard and fast thoughts on this. We can talk about it more after, but I do like the idea of using hardware acceleration. I think it's um, good to take advantage of it if it is available, uh, and it smooths out the transition. It helps with memory usage, uh, things like that. So I do, I do advocate it if it's available. Um, anything that we can do to make jQuery UI itself a little faster with its animations? Uh, the transitions using all. Now, I guess that was the CSS3 ones, but. What was that? Um, in the CSS3 transitions, there was the all functionality and uh -huh. added a bunch of event listeners, but anything you can do along these lines to speed things up. To speed something like that up? Yeah, so um, instead of using all, you can actually, there's a bunch of different properties that you can use individually, and so it'd be like width, height, um, there, there's a set of those online, I think on Mozilla, uh, would be a good resource for that. Um, but I would definitely recommend, as long as you're not doing a bunch of properties at once, specifying those each individually. Um, once you get over a certain amount, you might have issues with uh, keeping it all sane. Uh, so that's when you would use something like all, but you can do them all individually and that speeds it up by a lot and you don't have all those listeners. Oh, and jQuery UI? I'm not sure what your question is then. Well, oh. What speed of jQuery UI? oh, that's a great question. We should speed it up in jQuery UI. I'm not, I'm not sure. <laughs> sorry. Oh. oh, sorry. That was bad. <laughs> um, I just uh, recently I was seeing that there's some editors available, kind of like almost like a Flash editor was in the past that uses CS3 uh, animation. And I didn't know uh, what your opinion on it. Is that a good thing, a bad thing, or do you think that will be in the future, or will they, people be using it kind of like, you know, for simple animations, using some sort of editor where they can do, you know, frames and, you know, something a little bit more GUI-like? Oh, gotcha. Uh, I actually haven't played around with those or seen those, so I'd be really interested to see what kind of code it uh, outputs, um, but it definitely sounds like something that could be good for people making these animations. How, how about the team rollers uh, compare, compare with other uh, vendors that you just mentioned? What was that? Sorry. Team roller. Team roller, uh, you know, like the, the free software for jQuery to uh -huh. design CSS. Do you know team roller? I'm not quite sure what the question what is. What are you asking? So what are you asking? The oh, theme roller? Yeah. Theme roller. It, I mean, Theme Roller fills a very specific use case, okay. which is to design jQuery UI themes. Um, uh, so I don't, do you want to run with that? Not quite sure <laughs> um, what we're talking about, so no. <laughs> um, theme Roller does its job. Uh, I don't think we're going to be adding stuff into that for dealing with like adding amazing transitions to your themes. It's sort of meant as a jumping off point rather than like an all inclusive design tool. Yeah, unfortunately, I wasn't familiar with that. Hi. Um, 
I have recently experienced a jQuery UI bug, I think, uh, trying to animate on page zoom. The animation seemed to get messed up. I don't know if anyone else seen that. Like if you do control plus plus and then animation doesn't work anymore, right? Or um, it sounds like a bug. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure if I should report it or is you it something that. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I had a similar thing. I used to graph it, like, to first figure out like, the height of the animation and then it kind of mitigates it when it resizes it. So I didn't just need to hide it first and then apply that. Anything else? Oh. Um, so I've been using CSS3 and jQuery Animate for a very long time, and recently one of my clients required them to work on IE8 and 7. So I found one of the library online called TwinMax, and this was working I think in, in terms of the performance and other things, I, I found it a little bit better than the CSS3. And um, I'm not sure if have you ever been working with the TwinMax before and have you ever have anything comparing like the support of the browsers and the performance, something like that? That's not something that I've done, but I'd be interesting to, interested to see. Um, with the browsers, what I've tested on are the, the latest for Chrome and IE, um, or not IE, I'm sorry, Opera. Uh, so those are the, the test cases that I've done. Uh, however, I would be interested to see that. Um, in my results, though, it was pretty conclusive that CSS was faster uh, by a large amount than using jQuery. So I'm not sure if that answers your question, but. It's a library called TweenMax. I have not used that. Yeah, but I'd be interested to use it, so. Um, anything else? Let's get up for Jessica again. Perfect. Thanks. Woo!